What is up down and sideways, you fantastic individuals? It is League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you beauties for a rare, absolute banger double header matchup on a Friday. Usually these type of marquee showdowns are reserved for a Saturday or Sunday, but today we are blessed with the Friday show in Mark. We're blasting off into the weekend with some giga bangers, thanks to the LCK and the LPL. And depending on what time you're checking this out, even the LEC getting in that action for the playoffs. You love to see that happening. Things are heating up in the world of League of Legends. Let's dive right into talking about it. They obviously had to really make up for the lack of LCS this weekend. They said, <laughs> without our flagship programming, we got to deliver some S-tier matchups. And that was absolutely what we got in T1. Hanwha Life going the distance three games. All three of these games were exciting, compelling, uh, back and forth. Starting in that very first one, it was the T1 Slayer himself. Doran showing up with some help from his buddy Peanut. This rumble got ludicrously out of control. He started five and zero, and then in classic Doran fashion, proceeded to get caught three times in a row before he even could ult in a team fight. Everybody else loading in against T1 and, and Zayce over the last year has seen a, a Radon, an end game boss of an Elden Ring, a Dark Souls type of game. Meanwhile, Doran's looking at him like it's the tutorial boss. He's got no problem. It's just like regular dude. He's he comes back it to out. the tree sentinel at the start of the game, but he's <laughs> 80 hours in and proceeds <laughs> to just smash it. Oh man, he was ready. He heard my comments about Nar for Zeus yesterday and he wanted to make a point and he did early on the rumble picking up those kills, which were important because that lead was built up early by Hanwha Life and it was chipped away at by T1 over the course of some, uh, let's just call it exploration gameplay from Doran at that point. Um, being where he shouldn't have been is the long and short of it, but it was more than enough of an advantage gained out early on that they were still able to close things out in game one. Yeah, this game probably is about 15 minutes longer than it should have been if Hanwha played it clearly, but finally, when it is a full 5v5, you see just how disgustingly fed this rumble is as uh, Hanwha convincingly wins the final team fight. Uh, to clinch that first game, but still, north of 40 minutes and many angles. Guma almost has a 1v5 Zeri game-saving play at the end. Ah, they're so close, so close to being able to pull that off. It's, it's just too far away, right? It's just asking too much at that point. I like that T1 at least realize or are willing to take that chance, take that gamble on sending Guma in on that type of situation. That Guma is feeling his performance enough to take that chance for the team take that risk and know that he is you know trusted by his teammates to take that opportunity and that he can do it because we know he can that's where i'm seeing with this one even if this run this result doesn't turn out in the favor of t1 i like that angle from goomba and apparently doran you know saw how game one went and he was said i'm cooking i'm ready to go renekton sign me up for the quinn counter pick didn't quite have the same effect uh, as that Rumble did in the NAR matchup. And really, I feel like Game 2 came to this comp because the Braum, Sejuani, Renekton trio, it felt like Viper could not ever have any chance of getting through this front line. He even finished Game 2 with 36,000 damage done, which was 14,000 more than anyone on T1. But so much of that was just getting slammed into a Braum shield or a beefy pig and crocodile. And any of those times you had those guys getting that engage on to Viper. Where's the damage? Well, Baker's Corky and Guma on Caitlyn from miles away. That absolutely was the safety. That is the composition. That was the play from T1. You called it out. Dorn rolling the dice on the Quinn, feeling like he still has got the, the grandpa energy against Mr. Zayus and gonna teach him another lesson. Not so much. This uh, Quinn was certainly grounded in this game, the way that the things went. And even Zeus in that 1v1, I think handled himself much better, stronger bounce back in the second game. And despite the loss for Hanwha Life, 
Peanut with one of the greatest escapes on Poppy that we'll see utilizing the full arsenal of modern League of Legends with Nimbus Cone phase rush. <laughs> You've got the blast cone to get out, dashing over the wall. Perfection. You, you don't see that three years ago. You don't see that play come through like that. Love seeing that from Peanut. I think that's one of those ones. Oh, we'll talk about it because obviously there is not obviously, but there is a down performance from him in this series, even if Honor Life is pushing things through. Got to talk about him in this series because he was a thorn in the side for T1. He was always negating the plans that they wanted to have set forth or, you know, hoping that this thing gets off the ground early. Peanut was making sure that that wasn't happening throughout the series. He was making all the important plays. And even though in game three, he was probably rocking about a 25% hit rate <laughs> on some of these Sejuani ultis. Throughout this series, he was landing smite after smite over owner. The early game, he felt like he was in his head. It He still had such a big impact, even though he was whiffing all these alts. He's, hey, he's, he's like, man, he, he learned from the baseball hall of fame. You just gotta succeed. Like, you know, three out of every 10 times, something around that type of zone. I don't even think he was hitting those numbers, no, to be honest. Below that average. <laughs> but the effect was there from that Sejuani. Again, rolling into game three, we we're continuing this, uh, you know, swip swappy of jungles that we rolled through in this series of those tank bruiser jungles. Sejuani junglers. poppy every game, and they just swapped who was playing which. Not necessarily what I want to be seeing, you know, maybe from peanut you can make that angle unfortunately i think now in his career there is an exciting angle in those champions and how he's able to utilize it for the team owner i think you want a little bit more than just the sejuani and the poppy it's the ap team jungler one. meta what's going on what are these guys doing i don't know but it was not enough on the day. Game three goes the way of Hanwha life. You know, T1, they have advantages in this third game, but those advantages mean nothing in the eyes of Viper when he's got himself the Ezra. If you were removing uh, name tags in this, you would 100% think Hanwha is T1. Number one, because they win a team fight, they have no business winning when they're behind, and all of a sudden they close the game out. That's a vintage T1. You also got a bard running around the rift, impacting every single one of these team fights, and you go, yeah, Kyria, chalk it up, give him the MVP, T1 wins the series. Oh no, that's Hanwha Life, AKA Gen G Delight, who was popping off on the bard. I, I don't think we've ever seen T1 get abused by a bard quite like oh. this since especially not since we've seen that bard become that iconic pick for Kyria through that world's run and making the plays happen. On the other hand, this time for T1 getting the the rough rub down by Mr. Delight on this singing champion. He'd love to see making this one work. Bard, very unique champion, of course, in League of Legends. Uh, this series was a fun one at the end of the day to look through it. And it's one of these ones where, of course, you can be super critical, light the flame on T1 and everything like that. But I think the realistic point of view is to look at this one and understand this shapes up that top four picture of the LCK into a better territory, especially knowing, again, what we have seen from D plus Kia, Gen G, this type of zone, feeling hot about it. Even a KT roster looking, you know, like they're taking care of business in their Born own type of fashion. KT, but we're not excited. Nope, we're keeping things calm, but absolutely they're rising up in the LCK. And so with this match with Hanwha Life getting this type of edge T1, still showing us that they're in this type of com competitive zone, this feels good for the LCK as a whole. Yeah, and how about if D Plus plays a competitive series even against Gen G over the weekend? All of a sudden, that top four shrinks even more to how uh, close. So, yeah, competitiveness overall for the LCK should be excited for a Hanwha Life win. Also treated to the new round two debut, Top Esports and BLG both playing their first matches since the EWC. And much like Hanwha and T1, we go the distance and at the very least, game one. We're getting a 40 minute banger and these back and forth team fights in this first game were absolutely in insane and absolutely what you expect between the two best teams in the LPL. 
This is that, you know, those, you know, old boomer toys of those rock 'em, sock 'em robots, you know, the uh, controlling Classic. type of thing. It's just one haymaker after the other. Swinging nobody's the other blocking. One. They're just, they're nope. just taking Nobody's theirs. blocking. The heads are popping off and they're just slamming them back down and going right back into battle was the way this game one rolled on through. You had it all across the board, but man, oh man, you got to look at top esports and you got to be saying to yourself, we, we, you know, you get the full barrage more or less in game one from top, e uh, from excuse me, from BLG, from everybody, and everybody on top esports, even your boy Cream in the mid lane, stacks up in that first game and matches toe to toe. And you know, maybe it went back and forth who was in control with this game, but it never really got out of hand. Even when one team got an upper hand, it was you know slow rolling. But Mako had a great game on the Orn, uh, Jackie Love on the Senna, and. Obviously, that became a theme in this series as they piloted that bot lane all three games throughout, and it worked in game one, so they really felt like, let's continue rolling with that. But in game two, it seemed like the momentum might still be there for TES because Tien's early game on Lee Sin was vintage 2019 world's MVP kind of level, but apparently that awakened something in night, seeing his best buddy play like that because games two and three, this is the first time I feel like since Knight joined BLG that I can say, oh, that's the guy who we've talked about as the best mid laner in the world. We've checked in every now and then, we've gotten excited here or there talking about a good to great level performance from Knight. This is the superstar. This is the spectacular level of performance from Knight that he is able to differentiate himself from the other elite level players in the world and really showcase at that highest of levels that we talk about. Unbelievable performance in this game two and it continues into game three, which we'll get to. But in this game two, it really sets the tone for the rest of this series. And it really kind of was one of these answers of, okay, game one was close. Oh, game one, Kareem, you're able to keep pace with me, make a couple plays here or there. You know, I made a mistake, all these type of things game two it was the full force it was the clean performance no mistakes and it was all about night and what he was setting up and knocking down for blg and of course also got a shout out bin had some incredible cannon flanks he wasn't he wasn't going no zanya's cannon in this game he's going in <laughs> nuking with his ulti dying and having the rest of the boys clean up that's exactly what both uh elk and knight as you highlighted did uh but game three became Okay, BLG has fully woken up and are online because it steamrolled even quicker than Game 2. They were on the rift actually longer, but 23 kills to 5. It was an absolute stomp. Jun on the Kindred, his pocket pick. And listen, BLG picks up Wei as a sub. We're saying, is he going to start over Jun? Is he putting the pressure on? Well, if he puts more performances like Game 3 against TES here, I don't think Wei's seeing that starting lineup this split. There it is. There's the boost. Just got to high get bring in somebody else to sit right behind he's him. He's got to start sweating. Yeah, he's breathing down his neck, literally. <sighs> yeah, seats, seats feeling pretty warm. Gets him in the zone. Gets in the zone and gets sure the game performances that you need to have if you are Jeune for BLG. Important thing to take note of that one because this was not only a situation where maybe, you know, you're looking at that performance, you're looking at the angle of top esports getting that first game. You're looking at it as well as, okay, well, this is a series that is going to that third game. Maybe this is the substitute angle type of opportunity. Maybe this is why they wanted to bring in Wei. Sticks with Jun. Jun rewards them with that performance. The other thing I wanted to mention, of course, as we talked about earlier, is that Senna Orn, the Senna for Jackie Love and the way that rolling through that all three games in this series. Yes, I know I do love Jackie Love on the Senna. I think it is a, a, this weird concoction that it should never work out. A champion like Senna and a player like Jackie Love, yet it works out and combines into this monster. But it was certainly not a monster in games two and three in this series. And it was one of these angles of it just felt like they were going, we're free of fearless draft. We can roll through this every time we want to slam it down. They're, we're, they're not banning it, we're slamming it down. And I went, well, maybe we examine some things here before we just slam it right back down. You can't run it in the third game. I get it in game two because it is successful in game one. You run it back, it doesn't really work. You got to put Jackie Love on something with more urgency in that third game because Senna Orn feels like so two months ago now, which sounds ridiculous, but 
All these Kaisa, Caitlin, Ezreal picks are now swarming up in the LPL LCK globally. And you got to see Jackie Love on some of those to have some impact. Probably wouldn't have mattered because they got so stomped in the early game uh, in Game 3. And as we've highlighted, Knight does pick up both MVPs. How about a 17-0-18 and 18 scoreline in those two wins for BLG? Yeah, that's a difference maker. That is a difference maker. That is the outlier. That's the one you put all the numbers together. You look at that guy and you say, that's him. He's that dude. That is Knight, and he was able to deliver for BLG. Seeing the performances in a Honda Life in a T1 series on the same day, everything else checking it out, Knight dropping a bomb like this one in the series against Top Esports, a Top Esports that a lot of people, ourselves included, feeling good about since MSI post EWC what they were going to be able to do and it is a firm denial from BLG and from Mr. Knight in the mid lane. BLG leaving early from the EWC. TES makes it to finals. Gen G looks good in the LCK still. I'm starting to think we shouldn't take too much from what happened at that Esports World Cup. Yeah, I think that is going to be the safe uh, answer. I, mean, I don't want to think. I don't think that we should throw everything out with it. Should be little bits and bobs that you can grab from it as, as information or maybe signs of what's going on. Absolutely not making any sweeping uh, declarations based off of it. And this week back in the action has certainly answered in that same type of way to tell you what is going on with these teams. D plus Gen G over the weekend, as we've mentioned, and JDG anyone's legend. We're going to have a real solid picture of these top five teams in the world after those head to heads as well. Actually, kind of blessed that it is an off week still for the LCS to roll through these type of big matchups that we're going to get. It's only going to get better and bigger still in the LCK and the LPL as we get towards, uh, you know, working into playoffs, the gauntlet situations, all these type of things is going to heat up. LC, LEC rolling through, starting into the best of three, best of playoff situation as well. Man, this is going to be a good weekend for us League of Legends fans. We're heating up into that best part of the year where we're qualifying for summer playoffs and, of course, ultimately the world championship. But that is it today for League Unlocked. My name is Eric here with Mark. As always, thank you, you beautiful people, for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.